The Bible reading today is from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 16. Let us hear the word of the Lord. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking forward to a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Morning. You can hear me, I think, through this one, so I'll put this one to one side. Now, I'm going to get you all to stand up. Have a stretch. We've been here for a while. Take a chance to see someone next to you, say hi, turn around a few times, and I'll get myself organised here. Great, that feels better. Now, I'm not sure if the slides are working or not. I'll just make sure the pointer's still working. Can you hear me okay at the back? You can hear me all right. How are we going? That, now, if I point that, oh, there we go, that works. Excellent. Very good. All right, well, thank you again for the privilege of being with you. Let's, uh, let's just have a quick prayer and then we can get into it. Father God, we come to you because we want to... We want to know you, we want to know the truth about the world that is around us, we want to see things as they are and we want to be encouraged and changed into the image of your Son. Guide us in that, guide our, the words, open our hearts and ears to understand things as they truly are, in Jesus' name, Amen. Um, thank you again, um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name's David Mills, I'm currently working here at the clinic as a doctor and myself and my family lived in Papua New Guinea for 23 years until just recently. Actually, um, I was thinking about that as we were doing church this morning. It's, uh, it's been a longish service, but not really long by world standards. And in PNG, we sit on the concrete floor for the, the three hours the service goes. So it takes a bit of getting used to. Uh, you, get, you get calluses in places you don't normally have them. <laughs> and um, <coughs> so it's nice to have some, some cushions on the chairs. Uh, we moved there in 2000 and uh, at that stage our daughters, uh, Natasha, this is taken a little bit later, Natasha was just 19 months old and Ashley was just three months at the time. We subsequently had two more and there's a host of other PNG children which make part of our tribe as well, so we're a big, we're a big crew. Um, and the kids schooled mostly in PNG, for, uh, in, in Compium I should say, around the hospital. Karen started a small school. But later on, um, Natasha and Ashley had to go to boarding school. Uh, there's a big mission school on the other side of the country, uh, run by Wycliffe Bible Translators, interestingly. Most of the kids that were there uh, are from the US, 
some from Europe and Asia, but mostly from the US. Anyway, uh, one particular time as the technology got a bit better and we could start to have WhatsApp conversations with the girls, we were having this video chat one Sunday afternoon and I noticed that Natasha was wearing an Adelaide Crows jumper, which may not seem very remarkable to you, but Natasha's not really into footy and of course having lived in PNG, which is not an AFL country, um, footy, I sort of said to her, what, what gives? What's with the Adelaide Crows jumper? Like, you're not really a footy person. And she said, well, you know, Dad, in this school, these kids from the US, they have these jumpers. I don't know if you know anything about the college system in the US, but you've probably seen it on telly. They wear these unusual jumpers with a big letter on one side. You recognise that? And it represents the college in which, you know, they, they, um, they, they, they study now, of course, these American kids hadn't been to that college either, but, that, but basically what they were saying was, this is where I'm from, you know, just wanting to let you know that, you know, my folk went to such and such a university. And it was really getting to her, and she was kind of, you know, reaching back through her past, all like, you know, where are we from exactly, Dad? Like, you know, she'd grown up in PNG, and, and she's sort of, you know, scratching through, oh, we're from Adelaide, what's the footy team in Adelaide? Oh, we're the Adelaide Crows jumper. And that was kind of her way of just... You know, who actually am I? Who am I um, in this journey in which I'm going? Now, that's kind of the theme of this message this morning in some ways. It really does reflect something which I think we all feel, but feel, but certainly you feel it when you live and work cross-culturally as we did. Because I can say after 23 years of having lived in PNG that there was no point at which I felt I'm a Papua New Guinean now. But the problem was, after some time, I didn't feel Australian anymore either. And so you're kind of like a person who's been cut adrift of their moorings, and you don't really know, who, who actually am I? Where do I belong? What, what am I now? Where exactly do I fit? And that's exactly the situation that's described in this passage. And this particular passage, in fact, the book of Hebrews generally was incredibly important to me, in my spiritual journey and in the time we had in Papua New Guinea. But this passage in particular was of enormous importance to us and um, I've spoken on it a number of times, it's deeply important to me and I hope you will be encouraged by it as well. Um, it really is a message that as Christians we need to come back to over and over in this world which is really changing so fast. I mean the world is changing enormously quickly and the things that we kind of took as a given a generation ago are all up for grabs now, whether it's climate or people's views on social issues, it really does feel like a world that is quite shaky in many ways. Well, let me, um, this was Tash at boarding school and I've got behind my slides already, um, I want to talk about Abraham. Now, you may be completely new to church and you may not have any idea who Abraham is. Abraham is the father of the Jews, uh, he's also the father of the Arabs interestingly, both groups in, in the media a lot at the moment. But in the Bible, much more important than both of those things, Abraham is the guy who's called the father of faith. He's the father of people who believe. That's the significance of Abraham in the Bible story. He was a guy who was born and raised in uh, what's now southern Iraq, around about where the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers come together. And at some point, his father, his brothers they moved right up towards the sort of Turkey-Syria border, up in the mountain country, the headwaters of the Euphrates, to a place called Haran. And what happens there is that his father dies. And he's buried there, his bones are still in that place, and in our immigrant culture, that doesn't matter so much. Of course, where your, where your parents' graves are matters to us sentimentally, but in other cultures, where your clan, where your people are buried is a deep, significance to, to them. This is Abraham's home, this is where his people are, this is where his father lies and yet at some point the Scripture says that God comes to him and says, I want you to move, get out of your country, leave those, leave your family, leave your father's house, leave your plans for the future and go to a place that I will show you, that I will show you. Now, that's amazing. I just want you to imagine this scenario. Let's say you feel like God is calling you to go to the mission field and you put your name forward to 
the Church Missionary Society or some other mission agency and they say, yes, we accept you for missionary service and um, be ready with your bags packed, you're heading off at such and such a time and you go and tell your family about it and they say, well, okay, you're leaving everything behind, you're leaving us behind, where exactly are you going? And you say, well, actually, I don't know. They haven't told me yet. Imagine how that would go down, how that would play out amongst your family. Um, That's exactly what Abraham's scenario was. It says, leave your family, leave everything that's important to you, leave all of your foundations, go to a place I'm going to show you at some point. Now, that's extraordinary. And yet, there is a sense in which I think all people feel a little bit like that. I mean, we are creatures of time and none of us can see behind the next corner. Every human being has a sense in which I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But for Christians, that particular scenario is especially resonant because when you place your life into the hands of another master, into the hands of the Lord, which means, this is what it means to believe, it means I am placing my faith, my whole life into your hands. We, we shouldn't be mistaken about this. Believing in Jesus is not just an assent, an intellectual um, understanding. I think it's very much like having an anaesthetic, and I do anaesthetics quite a bit, and um, it, it is a, a, an incredibly vulnerable time for people. You know, you, you come to the doctor and they say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to knock you unconscious and control your breathing while they do an operation too, and at the end of it, I'm going to wake you up again. Now, you can say, yes, I believe you're going to do that and good luck to the next person, but not for me. So that's, that's, that's a, a certain sort of belief, isn't it? But the belief that says, okay, you lead me through those swinging doors, put that thing in my arm and squeeze the syringe, that's a different sort of belief. That is total commitment to a person that you hardly know um, on the faith that that person has the capacity to do what they say they're going to do. That's real faith. That's what belief means in a scriptural sense. I'm committing myself to this God. What Paul says in, uh, in Timothy, he says, I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that thing which I've committed to him until that day. That's what faith means. And so, to do that is what discipleship means. And yet, we have no idea what tomorrow will bring absolutely none. That's the truth of it. And so, Abraham's story resonates for us. When we were getting ready to go to PNG, um, we were in someone's house and we came across a particular poem. This poem meant so much to me and still continues to mean a great deal and I actually printed some copies out, I'll leave them at the back for those who are interested. It has a fascinating story behind it, I won't go into it for the sake of time, but it's called The Gate of the Year. It was actually found by, um, a very, it was written by a very obscure poet in the UK. It was actually found by a very young Queen Elizabeth. She was only 13 years old. She gave it to her father, the then king, who read it to the British people on the eve of World War II. It's a very famous poem and it says this, and I think I've put it up here, someone. Oh, yep, that's the verse. It says this, I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, please give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown? And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. And so I went forth and finding the hand of God, I trod gladly into the night and he led me toward the hills and the breaking of the day in the lone east. And the poem goes on. It's a remarkable poem. Now, that, um, I wrote that in the front of my Bible in March uh, 2000, uh, just as we were about to leave for Papua New Guinea. Um, it's been very poignant to us. The Christian journey is not one where we can expect God to show us everything that is before us. Our journey is more like that of Abraham, to walk forward in obedience every day, trusting God to be the one who holds enough wisdom and has enough capacity to choose the right way for us and to enable us to walk in it. Now, I don't know if you sing hymns in this church, but there is a beautiful hymn by a guy called Horatio Bonar, 
uh, two of which verses read as follows. Thy way, not mine, O Lord, however dark it may be, lead me by thine own hand, choose out the path for me. Smooth let it be, or rough, it will still be the best, winding or straight, it leads right onward to thy rest. That's the path that Abraham took, going out not knowing where he was going. But then the next verse says this, this is verse 9, it says, By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger, in a foreign country. He lived in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were the heirs with him of the same promise. Now, I find this remarkable, because not only did he leave all that he knew, and he went out blind to an unknown place, but when he gets to that strange place, he doesn't end up owning a square foot of it. Not a bit. He lives in tents. The key word is tents. Tents is what nomads use. Vagrants, vagabonds. He spends his entire life, if you read the story, moving up and down, pitching his tree under, you know, pitching his tent under one tree or another, moving up and down his entire existence. Now, I, I read that and I thought, can you imagine Abraham you know, somewhere up there in the mountains of Bethel, perhaps looking down on some of these cities, and there were cities, significant cities, along the Jordan and thinking, you know, look what I've left behind, what's my brother doing, what are they all up to, what cities are they building, here am I living in tents. Some regret, is it possible you think that maybe there was just a pinch of regret? He would have to have been a very strange person if perhaps that temptation did not come to him. And I think the application for this is incredibly important. And that is that when we choose to follow Christ and commit our all to Him and walk with Him, that does not guarantee you success in this life. Not in the, world, the way that the world understands that. It's incredibly important to understand this. Often, I think we think, and I have to say, I think, you know, I've heard this preached and it really needs to be challenged. There is no trade-off with God. This idea that if I give my all to Him, somehow He will give me the things that my heart secretly wishes. It's what the lawyers might call a quid pro quo. You know, this idea, you, I give you something, He's going to give me something in return for all of the good things that I've done in obedience to Him. No such guarantee is given us in the Scriptures. What is given to us is that He will be our God and that we will be His children for all eternity, that He will make us into the image of His Son and that He is going to bring forth His plans and His fruit whatever they may look like. But the road of history is very long and convoluted and only God can see it stretched out to its full length. And so the short term may well not look as we perhaps may wish it to. Ours is to trust. And this is where we learn what makes Abraham so important to the story of not only the, New Te the Old Testament but the New Testament as well because how does someone do what he did? How does someone leave it all behind, leave all of their moorings, get to this place and find it doesn't give them those same things that perhaps you gave up? How does someone cope with that? How does someone feel at peace? Well, verse 10 gives us the answer. He managed because he was looking forward to a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Well, that word foundations jumps out at me in that verse. It's a word that really resonates, I think, in, this, in today's context where so much is shaky. And it begs the question, you know, what, what do you build your life on? What are the foundations of your life? What is it? that gives you meaning and peace. 
Is it something that's unshakable? Or is it something that can only be shaken and erased with time? See, Abraham looked at the cities that were around him, but somehow he was able to sense and know that those cities were temporary. And indeed, if you go to Palestine or that part of um, the Near East, most of those major cities are now archaeology, you know, potential projects. They're under the dust. They no longer exist for all of their um, impressiveness at the time. Abraham understood that and he looked past the material things of what could potentially have been his, uh, been his and he looked to the person who had promised him. Verse 13 says this, All these people were still living in faith when they died and they did not receive the things that were promised. But they saw them afar off and they were assured of them. They embraced them and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Well, this is deeply comforting to me. I think every human being at some point understands that feeling of being different, odd perhaps, some more odd than others, um, being not fitting in in some way. If you're an immigrant in our community in Narracourt and you're not white, uh, you would feel that every single day. And having lived cross-culturally, I knew the reverse of that. All of a sudden, it kind of opened my eyes as to what a minority might feel like. You don't fit in. You don't speak the same language. You don't have the same ways of thinking. It's very odd. But of course, every human being feels that in one way or another. And it's quite a noxious feeling, really. It's very unpleasant. Everyone wants to fit in. Everyone wants to have some kind of affirmation, some kind of... Um, praise to help us to settle and some people will go to great lengths in order to achieve that. Um, identity is the, is that not the key word of our age at the moment? Identity is really uh, right at the centre of the cultural thinking right now. The search for identity is really um, so central because in finding my identity that's what gives my soul rest. That's what gives me affirmation. That's what gives me security to know who I am and where I fit in the world. Well, sometimes even as parents, we go to great lengths, for those of you who have been parents, or, uh, you know, to help our kids to fit in at school. You know, we perhaps buy them the right clothes so that, you know, they fit in. I, my parents were not wealthy and I knew what it was like to go to school in second-hand clothes and because I was growing so fast, they were nearly always halfway up my legs and, you know, my jumpers never came to my wrists, so I always would pull them up and, you know, it was, it was a bit odd. I was always odd and never got over being odd, really. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, so if your parents had the money, of course, you would buy what it takes to help your kid to fit in. And that's one approach that parents may take. Uh, and of course, we do that for ourselves in one way or another. But Abraham's story shows something radically different. And it's really at the heart of this message this morning. How did Abraham cope with feeling continually like a foreigner? Just picture, remember, he's wandering up and down with his tents in amongst all of these established cities. He's the outsider. He's the foreigner. He's this guy who's moved in, his sheep are grazing around us, he's not one of us. How did he cope with that feeling? Well, here's the answer. It says, he actually acknowledged and embraced the fact that it was true. Embraced the fact that it was true. And this is the choice for every single one of us who struggles with this sense that somehow I'm different. And as Christians... You know, this, this message has enormous poignancy. Let's be honest about this. Our culture tolerated this sort of behaviour that we're doing right now, sitting in pews, singing in songs, talking about God things. They've tolerated that for a long time. It's actually been part of the cultural milieu that is acceptable. But the world is changing fast around you. 
very fast. And it may well be before a generation is passed that this thing that we do today will be seen not just as an oddity but as something that's dangerous and really shouldn't be accepted. Now, if that happens, um, then those of us who feel slightly odd today will start to feel extremely odd um, and um, shaky before too long. And so this, at that point, then what do you do? Do you try to find a way to fit in so that I can find my sense of peace and that it will be okay and that I'll be accepted? Or do you take Abraham's option and embrace the fact that you are different, that you are a stranger, that your home, in fact, is elsewhere? This is what Abraham's story shows to us. In taking that opposite road, we're acknowledging the fact that our home is in heaven, somewhere that has foundations, that's been prepared for us because of the loving, the loving sacrifice of the Son of God, sent to save every person who will cling to Him. And when we throw ourselves on the grace of God, we actually find that security that we're looking for. Because He's received us and we know that we're going to belong to Him for all eternity. Well, it goes on. Sorry. People who say such things as this show that they're looking for a country of their own. And if they had been thinking about the country that they had left behind, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. I uh, read the story recently of a missionary couple who uh, served for 40 years in Africa. Uh, I tried very hard to find her name, I couldn't find it. His name was Henry Morrison. And at the end of 40 years, they packed up their wares and they returned to New York City. Uh, this is just before the outbreak of World War I. And um, New York City was their home. The Missionary Society had organised a small one-bedroom flat for them. They were on the ship back from Africa. Unbeknownst to them, um, the retired President of the United States, a guy called Teddy Roosevelt, the other Roosevelt, um, had decided he wanted to go and shoot elephants in Africa. And um, at the end of that, he was returning to New York on the same boat. They got to New York and found the whole platform bursting with people, banners, bunting, welcome home. And the story goes that this uh, missionary guy looked out and was overwhelmed um, at the reception for them. <laughs> and... Uh, only to be uh, cruelly disappointed uh, when the president stepped off, the ex-president stepped off, and um, they, every, all the crowds dispersed, you know, the president and his entourage went first, then the rest of the plebeians <laughs> got to follow in their step, and no one was there uh, to meet them. And they went to their accommodation, which was this tiny, tiny little one-bedroom flat in New York, and he really struggled. He said, you know, this is unfair. I spent 40 years of my life serving the Lord in Africa and this guy gets to go and shoot elephants and the whole world comes out to, to greet him. What about us? What about us? And his wife, wise woman that she was, said, you can take your complaints to God. Why don't you take those complaints and tell him about them? Go and go and pray, which he did. Went and got down on his knees, prayed and came out a short while later and um, she noticed his face was looking much more relaxed and she said, I think you've worked this through and she, he said, yeah. I had a strong sense that God was saying to me, you're not home yet. Isn't that the message of these verses? Let me read them again to you. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. 
If they had been thinking about the country they'd left, they would have had an opportunity to return, but instead they're longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for him, for them. See, Abraham wasn't spending his days in Canaan pining for what he'd left behind, dreaming about what was going on, what buildings were being built, how his brother and the others were going, thinking about his long-lost father. He was looking forward to what was ahead and focusing upon the things that had foundations that were going to last for all time, not the things that could only be erased with the passage of time. And because of that, God says that he's not ashamed to be called their God. I love this part. Because the God that we serve is a personal God. I said this, I think, last time I was here. He's not an impersonal force. We come here not to get in touch with a a force that the universe shares. We're not coming to get in touch with the vibe. We're coming to pray to and worship a personal God who knows us. He says he's not ashamed to be called our God. He's personal and we can speak to him and he can speak to us. Do you know what it is to have that security of knowing that God is your God and that you are his and that he really is preparing something for you that has foundations, that can't be shaken, that is eternal in the heavens? And are you setting your hope upon Him? And are you longing for what God has prepared for you? Or are you longing for the things which time must certainly eventually destroy and erase? Well, in closing, if you are one of those people here today who has tasted something of the preciousness of what God has done for you, then I really want to encourage you through this message. Because the whole purpose of Hebrews... Hebrews and all of the books of the Bibles, they're not just collections of saying, perhaps with the exception of Proverbs, which is a collection of sayings, but certainly the New Testament letters, they're letters, they were written for a reason. And the reason behind Hebrews is to encourage people to endure. That's the message of Hebrews. It's about endurance in the face of problems, in the face of trials, in the face of difficulties. Don't give up. Look on, look ahead, push on to what God has in store for you. We will go through times of darkness and doubt. Uh, We will go through times of opposition, perhaps increasingly so. We have to be honest about that. Yet, let's be like Abraham, looking to the thing that has foundations. This church will not stand forever. Uh, It'll be gone. It'll be replaced by something else, hopefully a bigger and better church. But if not, uh, God's home will remain in the heavens, which cannot be erased across all time. That's the big point of Hebrews. This is what uh, he goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 12. He says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes upon Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Perhaps you are someone here this morning who knows nothing of what I'm talking about, knows nothing of the sweetness of the peace of God being your God Perhaps you are still clinging to some of those things that in the world, the world loves so much, our cars, our houses, our lifestyle, uh, the things that bring us comfort and yet these things have no real foundation because they cannot last. The football jumpers of the world that we cling to like Linus and his security blanket that give us a temporary sense of self and of security. Friends, I want to encourage you to hear the voice of the Saviour, the loving voice of Him to come out and to follow Him. Leave behind the sin, leave behind the futility. Futility is the word, meaninglessness of doing the same thing that others have done before us to no point. 
houses built on sand. They cannot last, they cannot save you, and they cannot even fulfil you. Only the God who has made us can do that. I can't tell you what your life will be like when you choose to follow Him. All of that is hidden. Only He knows, and that has to be enough, both for you and for me. I can't even tell you that it will be full of success, as the world defines it. But I can tell you that the life that you give to God will be treasured by Him and it will be used to work out His eternal plans for this world. And there's no more meaningful life for you or for me than that. Let's pray together. Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega, which means that before all things you have been and at the close of all things you will yet be. And we are here for a short time. With our loves and our passions and our desires and we lay them all at your feet and we say that you're the one who knows best and we want you to choose the path for us. Help us to trust you in times of success and times where success seems fleeting and passing and elusive. Help us and encourage us when uh, we're opposed or when we feel that the world is against us. Help us and cleanse us from the love of things that don't last. Help us to love and to long for the things that you have made for us and that will be lasting in all eternity. We thank you for the grace of the Saviour. We thank you for what you have given that we might understand the world as it is and that we may walk in the paths that you choose for us, those good paths. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the chance to be together this morning and to open your words. May you bless it to each of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.